The rim of daylight was fading. In the halls of heaven, it was now dark enough for the Aurora Borealis sisters to begin their lively dance of the veils. With an enchanting play of colors, they flitted light and quick about the great stage of the heavens, in fluttering golden dresses, their tumbling pearl necklaces scattering here and there in their wild caperings. Their spectacle is at its brightest shortly after sunset. Then the curtain falls. Night takes over. Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Schoen's novel, The Blue Fox, translated from the Icelandic by Victoria Cribb. This is a book that I reread every single year, on the first day that it snows every winter. Winter is my favorite season, and I just love books that have a wintry atmosphere. This is one of the reasons why I love Icelandic literature more generally, but Schoen's The Blue Fox not only has this wonderful wintry atmosphere that makes it a perfect read for a snowy day, but it's also just simply a beautiful myth. It's one of my favorite books of all time. It's this incredibly stripped back fable. It's very unadorned, very understated, and it's very short. Like most of Schoen's works, this book is more of a novella than a full novel. He writes these what I like to call, I probably read it somewhere, but what I like to call these epics in miniature, where he takes these grand social, historical, philosophical ideas and then just squeezes it down into the smallest, slimmest volume that he can possibly fit it in. His books acknowledge the size of the world, all the while taking place on the smallest of stages, as he said in an interview. The Blue Fox is perhaps Schoen's most famous work. It won him the Nordic Council Literature Prize in 2005, and it's this surreal myth or fairy tale or fable as stark and gorgeous as the wintry Icelandic landscape that it takes place in. And it's a rather simple narrative. It's a rather simple story. There isn't a convoluted plot here. There are two main storylines that make up this book. The first is the one that opens this book, which follows this hunter, whose name we learn is Reverend Baldur Skugason. As he, in the Icelandic highlands in January of 1883, is out hunting this blue fox. The second narrative happens just three days before this other hunt, and it follows this herbalist named Friedrich B. Fridjonsson as he is working to bury this young woman who just died. This young woman's name is Haftis Jonsdatter, or she calls herself Abba. See, she had Down syndrome, and she was actually found chained up in the hull of a ship that washed up on the shore of Iceland, and it seems like they were not treating her well at all. And Friedrich has been taking care of her ever since. And so this part of the narrative actually jumps back and forth between this, this moment a couple of days um, after she died where he is trying to bury her and a back a few years to kind of expand upon their relationship. Now, half this speaks in a language all her own and their relationship between these, these two people, this caretaker and this young woman, is really quite beautiful in so many different ways. Before we go any further though, we need to talk about the title of this book as it is completely changed from the Icelandic. Victoria Cribb is an incredible translator who has brought so many wonderful Icelandic books to the English language. But the title here is completely changed and it's clearly not her fault. It's clearly for marketing reasons. The title in Icelandic is Skugabaldr, which I get is totally unmarketable in the Anglophone world. But what does Skugabaldr mean? Well, as we just saw, it's almost the name of the reverend who is hunting this blue fox. His name is Baldur Skugason. Skugason being a patronymic in Icelandic, by the way, is not a surname. So he is, he is named Baldur, the son of Skugi. But more importantly, a Skugabaldr is the name of this hybrid animal beast creature in Icelandic folklore. It's a beast that is the offspring of a tomcat and a fox, or occasionally a dog. And these creatures, these skugabaldurs, are quite violent in a lot of ways. They attack sheep and other livestock, and they even attack people. But so this name, skugabaldur, is clearly very important for this book. As, as you can see, it's clearly referencing the blue fox that is being hunted, 
but it's also in a way referencing Reverend Baldur Skugason. And in fact, this shadowing is actually really important, right? Skuga is just the genitive of skugi, which just means shadow. So Reverend Baldur Skugason, his, his name is Baldur, the son of shadow. And so I hope that wasn't too confusing. My point was, is that the English loses this folkloric reference and therefore it loses this fabulism, this fantastic atmosphere that this book otherwise should have. But with that in mind, let me actually just read the first page of this novel as it sets up this quest narrative between the, the, this hunter and the fox that he's hunting. But you'll also see some of this mythic, fantastic fabulism that this book is operating on. Blue foxes are so curiously like stones that it is a matter for wonder. When they lie beside them in winter, there is no hope of telling them apart from the rocks themselves. Indeed, they're far trickier than white foxes, which always cast a shadow or look yellow against the snow. A blue vixen lies tight against her stone, letting the snow drift over her on the windward side. She turns her rump to the weather, curls up, and pokes her snout under her thigh, lowering her eyelid till there's the merest hint of a pupil. And so she keeps an eye on the man who has not shifted since he took cover under the overhanging drift here on the upper slopes of Ausheimer some 18 hours ago. The snow has drifted and fallen over him until he resembles nothing so much as a hump of ruined wall. The creature must take care not to forget that the man is a hunter. So there is this realist setting that is filled, I think, with this fabulous atmosphere. And throughout this chase scene, we're constantly jumping back and forth between the point of view of the fox, the hunted, and the point of view of the reverend, the hunter. It's an archetypal story structure, man versus beast, hunter versus hunted. The hunt narrative or the, tra the chase narrative is a personal favorite of mine. Um, Laszlo Krasnohorkai uses this a lot in a lot of his shorter uh, works. But here in The Blue Fox, just like in Krasnohorkai actually, there is something much more mythic, something much grander happening within this hunt. See, we're told in The Blue Fox that this hunt is happening on the upper slopes of Ausheimer, which if you know Old Norse or any Icelandic, you know that Ausheimer simply means home of the gods. Aus meaning god, right? Think of the Aesir. Aesir is just the plural of Aus. And the Aesir live in Auskar, which just means home or enclosure of the gods. So Ausheimer just means home of the gods. And this hunt is very much a stalemate, right? It's never a good hunt for the hunter if the hunted knows that they're being hunted. But this hunt has been going on for hours, almost a day. But it gives Reverend Baldur Skugason a purpose. All day long the vixen ran uphill and down dale, the man following hard on her heels. She was his letter of commission, setting him a task to perform in the material world. And so these two storylines, that of this hunt happening up in the highlands and this narrative of Frederick and Hafthis, they do kind of come together. Though not fully, not perfectly, which is good because it leaves a lot up to the reader. But what I particularly love about this novella is how these two storylines do parallel each other, but they're, all, they're also told in very different prose styles. The stark and austere prose style of the hunt narrative is counteracted with the lush and emotionally resonant uh, scenes between Hafthis and Frederick. And so now I'm going to spoil the book, so feel free to click away now, though there's a reason why I reread this book every year, and it's knowing the ending doesn't actually spoil it in any way. Much like any good myth or any good fable, the ending isn't the entire point. So Reverend Baldur Skugason shoots this fox, and the shot causes this giant avalanche, and eventually Reverend Baldur Skugason is swept into this cave where he is completely constrained by the snow. He's kind of dug out this small cave within this cave, um, but he is, he is fully incapacitated. And this is where this book gets really, really strange, as as Baldur in this cave, incapacitated, he begins hearing a voice, and lo and behold, it's the fox talking to him. The fox that he just shot, by the way, Reverend Baldur is yelling, and eventually he just hears the fox say, Do you want to deafen me? Reverend Baldur's heart missed a beat. The inquiry did not come from some searcher outside on the snowfield. No, the impertinent inquiry came from someone inside the fissure with him, and not only inside the fissure with him, but right up against him, or to be more precise, from inside his own clothes. And so the fox jumps out, 
and they begin talking, and eventually Balder tricks the fox, grabs her, and kills her once again. And then he crawls into the fox's skin and scampers off. And on his way out of the cave, he hears another, another fox barking in the distance. And the text reads, Skuga Baldur pricks his ears at the call. There's no mistaking the scent. It's a vixen in heat. Lust burns in his eyes. He puts his best paw forward and sets off down the fair valley. He will be the first to reach her. It is spring before the days of man. And that's where that storyline ends. But we find out in a final chapter that the young woman, Haftis Jonsdatter, well, she isn't Jon's daughter, but she's actually Reverend Baldur Skugason's daughter. He was the one who sold her into slavery to these foreign soldiers on whose ship Frederick found her years later. So within this mystical story of this folkloric Skuga Baldur, we get this, we get this incredibly sad story of abuse, trauma, and sincere love between Frederick and Haftis. And this is really where Schoen's genius lies. What is the real connection between these two stories? Was Haftis reincarnated as this blue fox? If so, why does she die three times, once as Haftis and twice as the fox? And did Reverend Baldur Skugason become the Skuga Baldur? And lastly, what does all this have to do with the history of Iceland more generally? Schoen is always interested in much larger, much grander national and cultural histories. Well, I think these are good questions and ones that I do have some answers for, but I think I'll with withhold my answers at least for now. Trying to fully pin down a myth or a fable seems to sort of miss the point. Maybe next winter on the first snow of the year, maybe when I reread this book for the I don't know, seventh or eighth time. Maybe then I'll feel that my answers have more solid footing. Or maybe I'll just have more questions. But for now, thanks for watching.